coming up, religious rights, scientific oversights, and snake bites. Also, Alan McPherson presents another recipe from hell. Another poor soul picks up the landline of the damned. And another, another unscripted, freewheeling segment of answering your questions. Get out the good dishes and the bottom shelf hooch for another episode of Kiss the Goat. Light a candle for the sinners, set the world on fire. Once again, the unpleasantly squeaky and reprehensibly heavy wooden doors to the online shrine to satanic cinema have swung open wide. And that took some effort. Those doors are fucking huge. Well, come on in. Grab yourself a seat within the sacred circle. The candles are lit. The incense is, is well, it's uh, incensing. And the ritual is about to begin. Leave your inhibitions at the door and kiss your sanity goodbye. All are welcome here in the dark. This is episode 58 of Kiss the Goat, and welcome to it. I'm ready to grab a case of beer, chill out for a bit, talk about a goofy movie, and oh my god, there's a snake in here. For crying out loud. A snake? Dude, you're always horny. No, I'm fucking, it's a snake. I'm serious. I don't know if I'd go that far. I mean, it's thick, but it's not like snake. Long. No, God damn it! I'm not talking about the staff of Ra. There's an actual snake crawling along the floor. <laughs> wait, wait a second. You named your dick the staff of Ra? It's coming near me. Well, well what color is it? It's black. Oh, well, well that's no big deal. And purple. Pur- but, but that, that's not a thing in the states, honey. And plaid. <laughs> what? I, I, I think that's plaid. There aren't plaid snakes, X. Oh, it's gone under the couch. Okay, well, I highly doubt it's a poisonous snake. Should we call a priest? Well, <laughs> why the fuck would we do that? We like snakes. You like snakes. I like <laughs> lizards and kittens. <laughs> well, is it still under the couch? Can you see it? No, but I know it's there. All right, well, I tell you what, why don't you gingerly walk into the kitchen, grab you some beer, and I'm going to introduce the next segment. Well, yeah, but what if the snake comes back out? Well, shit, I don't know. Give the snake a beer. You'll be fine. (laughs) Can't we make Stephanie do it? Well, I mean, we could, but Stephanie's not here. She went to discipline school, remember? The fuck is discipline school? Haven't you seen the story of O? Oh, God. I don't know if that's going to help. That girl's feral. (laughs) Oh, shit. I can hear the snake hissing. Fuck. Shit. Why is this happening right now? Well, I mean, I guess we shouldn't have left those heavy-ass doors open after all. In the meantime, let's dive into some real news with the devil in the details, our regular roundup of snippets of Satan stuff. I swear to God, I don't know where he finds these stories. So, in November of 2017, a woman in China died during a ritual meant to drive away a snake devil that had allegedly inhabited her body. Uh, Sorry, I'm, I'm back. Did the snake try to attack you? No, but I put a small dish of beer on the floor by the couch. Do snakes drink beer? You told me to do it! I don't know anything about snakes. Fuck! (laughs) Okay, well, tell everybody about this Chinese snake devil. All right. The victim's name was Hu Ruhuan, and I'm probably botching that all to hell. (laughs) I'm not always good with pronouncing names of humans from other countries, and if I've said that wrong, I'm very, very sorry. So, Hu Ruhuan... 
This person was married to a man named Chen Chunlong. Now, their daughter was sick with some kind of stomach problem. And even though they'd already taken the child to a local medical facility, Chunlong visited a local Banshan for a second opinion. A Banshan is a person who is believed to be a demigod that can take on all kinds of facets. But from what we can gather, this particular Banshan is some kind of shaman or magician or something like that. Kind of like an exorcist or a witch doctor. Yeah, but with more Taoist attributes. Like some Banshans are said to be immortal, so they've had a long time to learn things like how to get rid of snake demons, apparently. This Banshan told both Hu Ru Huan and Chen Chenlong that both Hu and both of their children had been possessed by a snake devil that was causing the illness. Now, the Banshan's advice was to drive the devil out of Hu Ru Huan by beating the hell out of her. Mm-hmm. According to the Banshan, the snake demon that possessed Hu was over... 500 years old and was the cause of their daughter's stomach illness. It wouldn't really be his wife that he was attempting to exercise, the Banshan said, because why not throw some disassociation behind Chen Chen Long's actions? He would actually be attacking the snake demon. If the ritual was successful, then who would not have any physical scars? Chen Chen Long put his wife through a series of rituals that lasted more than a week. Among the things that Hu endured were being hit on the back of the legs with an axe. A fucking axe. So, according to news outlet Asia One, two of Chen Chunlong's brothers held Hu down while she was being hit. And when that didn't work, Chen forged a sort of whip out of a belt and flogged Hu until she died. But Chen told investigators that his wife was totally cool with it. The Banshan allegedly said that they had to be firm while performing the ritual because, quote, it was for the sake of the kids, end quote. Chen also said that who agreed to the entire procedure. Who died of traumatic shock from having the actual shit beat out of her. Chen Chunlong and his brothers were facing 10 years of prison for the murder as of February 2019, but I couldn't find any information about the actual sentencing. Man, what about the kids? According to reports, the children were present during the actual purging, which, you know, that's fucking terrible. But I couldn't find out if the stomach illness went away. I'm betting it did, or where the kids are now. Okay, so let's let's sort of break this down. A little girl gets sick. Her parents take her to the hospital. And even after that, they go to an allegedly spiritual leader to see what to do. And the Banshan says, flog your wife until the snake demon leaves her. That's pretty much it. And then she died. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's, that's it. I just don't understand how anyone could think that that was a good idea. Like, how does that possibly seem like the right thing to do? Well, I mean, I'm sure there are cultural differences at play here, and probably some superstitious belief systems. I mean, I'm, look, I'm sure it made sense at the time to the people involved. But for me, the real problem here is that the Banshan told them that they were actually attacking the snake demon. That idea, I mean, that, that kind of gaslighting. And like you said, disassociating violence against the woman from trying to get rid of the snake demon inside of her is just wildly insidious. It, right? I mean, if one of our kids got sick and a local minister told you that our child would get better if you beat the living shit out of me, I would hope that you would ponder that real fucking strongly before you decided to lay a hand on me. Oh, I know better than that. I mean, and, and this is the God's honest truth. If you raise a hand to me, we're fucking done. I know. I mean, if you hit me, you better knock my ass out because that should give you just enough time to pack your shit and hide somewhere. I know. And if I ever hit you without consent... Well, I mean, we're not talking about spanking, obviously. Well, sure. But, I mean, I would absolutely expect some kind of retaliation if I just hauled off and punched you. But that seems like something that should perhaps transcend borders. If a spiritual leader tells you to harm another human being under the guise of carrying through with some kind of demon or devil expulsion ritual, don't do that. Right. 
So one of the basic tenets of believing in the devil, if you do indeed believe in the devil, is that the devil wants to harm people, hurt them, destroy them. So if some kind of faith healer or spiritual person tells you to start wailing on someone else because that's the thing that forces of light want you to do, they're wrong. They're flat out fucking wrong. I mean, that's just what the devil would want you to do, right? It seems to be true the whole world round, okay? Be aware. Exorcists are everywhere. Remain vigilant. Don't get suckered by these sick fuckers. It's about spectacle. It's about control. And most of all, it's about money. Your money. Why do we do this segment? I mean, <laughs> well, normally the rest of the show is pretty silly, right? But we think it's important that as nonsensical as Hollywood movies can make the devil seem, there are people out there who instantly blame dark forces for everything that happens to them or people around them. And because of the nature of this show, which has a weirdly strong foundation in religious studies and the crumbling difference between wrong and right, we feel like it's important to highlight these kinds of situations. Yeah, and maybe we're screaming into the abyss. I don't know. I just think that if you want to see the devil, look around you. Because to quote the band, Bonnie Stillwater, the devil is people. I'm sure some people think we're the devil. Yeah, probably so. So, hey, what's that snake doing? Is it still under the couch? Uh, I don't see it, her. I don't know what gender a snake is, and I'm not going to assume nothing. But that <laughs> that dish of beer is empty. Well, I guess it must have been thirsty. Give it some more. Are you fucking kidding me? Well, I mean, it apparently likes this stuff, which is kind of odd, I guess. All right. I mean, I can pour one out for the horrible thing that's currently living under our sofa. I won't fucking like it, but I'll do it. Why don't you set up the uh, next bit while I pop a top for our visitor? <laughs> I can do it. Gather around, acolytes. Shh. It's movie time. movie combines two of our favorite genres, the nature run amuck movie and the devil movie, into one gigantic laughable mess. It's Jaws of Satan from 1982, starring Fritz Weaver, Christina Applegate when she was just a wee lass, and a gigantic fucking King Cobra. This movie is also known as King Cobra, but that's just not devilish enough. Also, it sort of sounds like a shark movie. Or a metal band from the 80s that featured Carmine Apiece on drums. You might know that band for their stellar work on the title song for the movie Iron Eagle. Never say die, y'all. <laughs> Jaws of Satan was directed by Bob Claver. Is that right? Claver? Sure. Claver? Claver? Claver. Claver. Anyway, he did a lot of television work. <laughs> He directed episodes of The Facts of Life, The Dukes of Hazard, Charles in Charge, and The Munsters Today, which was really just, eh. Well, if nothing else, the movie looks pretty good because the director of photography for Jaws of Satan was none other than Dean Cundy. Cundy worked on Jurassic Park with Steven Spielberg, and he was the director of photography for a number of John Carpenter movies, including my favorite Carpenter flick, The Fog. Anyway, surely all this talent wasn't wasted on a movie about a snake possessed by the devil wreaking havoc in an Alabama town, right? Right? Let's take a look at Jaws of Satan, and oh, guess what? We're, we're going to spoil it from hell to breakfast. <laughs> So in a scene that was surely the inspiration for the opening sequence of Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade, we see a train barreling through the southern U.S. On board the train are a bunch of dogs heading towards a new life of indentured <laughs> servitude and potential torture at a dog track, a large snake bound for a carnival, and two shiftless-looking guys who are sort of half-assed watching over the animals. But the dogs are going nuts, they're barking, and the man who's in charge of the dogs, for some fucking reason, believes that there must be a stowaway in the dog compartment. 
So he grabs a blunt instrument. What is it? A, an axe handle or some shit? And I he, don't even know. He goes storming into the next car. And he's all, who's in here? And he stops in front of the box where the snake is housed. And almost as if by some kind of black magic, the padlock opens by itself and falls to the floor. The man's terrified and he makes his mouth drops open and he backs away and the lid of the box begins to lift. And then suddenly the side door of the train car he's in slides open. And the man screams and puts up a token fight, but he falls out of the moving train and lands on the on the ground, and he's he's dead. His, so, this scene, do you think the guy got bit by a snake? No. See, because I didn't think he got bit by the snake either. But didn't they find him later, and he wound up being, like, in intensive care because of a snake bite? Oh, was that the, was that the guy? I think it was, because initially I was like, oh, that dude got off fucking lot. He fell backwards out of a train and landed in some tall grass. Like I, I thought he was fucking dead. Was it a snake? I don't know. I, I guess he did get bit by the snake before he I'm, fell out of the fucking train. I mean, either way, you're fucked. Well, yeah. <laughs> but the train wasn't going all that fast. I think he could have survived the fall off the train. And I was actually kind of surprised later. When he showed up and she was like, he's in critical condition. I've never seen a snake bite like this before. <laughs> I've never seen someone who's fallen out of a vehicle before. I'm a <laughs> doctor. All right. Well, I thought he was dead. Maybe he's not dead. Fuck it. I don't know. What matters at this point is that his compatriot, who is still on board the train, um, is bitten by the hand by his dog, this kind of mangy, mutt-looking creature. And then the door to the next train car unlocks, and when it opens, that area is filled with a strange red light that wasn't there when his asshole buddy went to check on the racing dogs. But sure as shit, that man is confronted by a king cobra that rears up on its tail, and it's face-to-face -face with this guy, and if you look closely, actually you don't have to look very closely at all, but you can see the reflection of the snake's face in a piece of plexiglass cleverly placed by the film's insurance bonding company between the snake and the actor. This happens practically every time that Cobra gets face to face with somebody and the filmmakers made no attempt to cover it up. Because of King Cobra. Right. And then there's an on screen title card showing a, a Bible verse about how snakes are the devil or some <laughs> shit. I didn't really pay attention. It's Revelations 20, verses 2 and 3, and I will read them if you want me to. Oh, by all fucking means, read the scripture on the Devil Movie podcast. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil, and Satan, and bound him a thousand years, and cast him into the bottomless pit, and shut him up, and set a seal upon him, that he should deceive the nations no more, till the thousand years should be fulfilled. And after that, he must be loosed a little season. Apparently at a carnival. Just because. <laughs> That's what you do. It's, it's like time out. All right, <laughs> you stand in that corner for five minutes, and then I'm going to loose you for a little season. Then you can have a snack. <laughs> but after that, right back in the corner you go. Because so I know you're going you're gonna to act up again, you little shit. Right, so your mom and dad come here, and then nothing fucking happened, right? We don't talk about this. So here's my thing about about the title card. It says that the quote is from the book of Revelations, which, of course, doesn't exist. It's Revelation, no S. More <laughs> properly, that book is known as the Revelation of St. John. It has been used to justify a horde of horror movies in a misguided attempt to give them more gravitas. Cause, you know, it's beautiful, though, dude. Yeah, but I mean, if you're going to ground something in reality, why not use the Bible? <laughs> I'm serious. Revelation is just like dude on a fucking shroom trip. It is the actual precursor to Lovecraft. Love it. Sometimes I don't know what the fuck Lovecraft's talking about either. <laughs> and Revelation is not that far from it. There was a time when I was like 12, 13, I was obsessed with Revelation. Read it over and over again. Well, me too. I think everybody who's raised Christian goes through that phase. But after a while, you're like, okay, wait a minute. 
there's a dragon woman in a fucking hot air balloon <laughs> going over the eastern wall of Judah, and then it gets shot in the head, and then it comes back. What? What, what the hell's going on here? And you can't take that seriously. You just can't. But there are so many people who do. They're like, oh, this is literal. This is an absolute literal book. It's fucking not. If the whore of Babylon is, you know, riding a parachute through the thermals, no, that's it's it's not happening. Okay. <gasps> All right, done with that. So now it's when we meet Father Tom Farrow. Father Melancholy. He, yeah, he's played by Fritz Weaver. Weaver seems just as pleased to be in this movie as the audience is to watch it. He's dour. His jokes just fall flat. As He's pr- like the worst priest ever. It's probably just straight Everclear in his teacup. Yeah. He, he is a bummer. Even his housekeeper doesn't like his jokes. <laughs> and after dinner, Father Pharaoh settles down for some light reading, which involves opening a heavy ancient tome with wood-carved engravings of demons as illustrations. I love how he tells his housekeeper just to leave the the flask of wine. He's like, "Eh, leave it. I'm going to do some reading. (laughs) It's so Hal Holbrook in The Fog, right? Why don't you come in tomorrow at 6, Bennett? (laughs) So here's my question. Like most Cathols and Devil movies, Father Pharaoh is just just a self-loathing pile of gray just his very presence brings the room down can you think of a happy catholic in a devil movie well it's not a devil movie per se but cardinal glick in dogma was pretty happy didn't he get killed by avenging angels over the buddy jesus statue yep and he joked all the way up to the bitter end okay that's fucking weird uh my answer was just no So maybe you win on that? (laughs) Father Pharaoh's got a fire going in the fireplace, but while he's reading, he gets cold, so he moves closer to the fire like George Lutz in the Amityville Horror. But the fire goes out, and Pharaoh reaches into the fireplace because, you know, that's going to help. Even the logs are cold. And that's how unappealing this guy is. His mere presence just put out the fire in the fireplace. Even fire hates him. (laughs) So why not show the good father at a fancy party? And let's call this the exposition party. And it's just the first of three major info dumps in this flick. The first one tells what's going on in this tiny town, which is called, I shit you not, Utah, Alabama. (laughs) The party is being held by a local entrepreneur and general asshole named Matt Perry. Not the Matt Perry from Friends, although I can see why one would think that. Perry has a pretty blonde wife and a darling little blonde daughter named Kim. Now, Kim is played by Christina Applegate, and she's maybe 11 years old in this movie. Easily the best performance in the whole flick. Yeah. She's really, really good. Perry's hoping not only to put the town on the map, but he's also going to get a cut of all those sweet gambling wages from people betting on the dog races. Also in attendance at this party is a woman named Evelyn, played by Diana Douglas. Now, Evelyn calls herself the town witch. She's a real-life witch! She has a crystal ball, she reads palms, she reads tea leaves, and apparently coffee grounds, which will work if there are no tea leaves available. When Evelyn reads Kim's palm, Evelyn tells her that the mystic message is, Obey your parents. How very Old Testament. The mayor is there, too, and he's schmoozing votes because he's a schmuck. Uh, Father Pharaoh is against the racetrack. His logic towards the situation is very Robocop. (laughs) He believes gambling is bad and that it's going to lead to trouble. You know, but who gives a shit what this guy says? Nobody likes him. Why should they? He looks like the living embodiment of chain smoking. (laughs) Evelyn tells Father Pharaoh that she's been doing research on him. Like, fucking why? (laughs) How fucking bored are you? So she's been looking into his genealogy. And, you know, this is what, 1982, 83? It's Mm -hmm. not like the father had a grinder account. 
she mumbles something about druids and witches, and she offers to read the his leaves or grounds, whatever they are. And his... I don't think she offered. I think she was like, I am very interested to look at your cup. And she just snatches it out of his hand and walks away. And he follows her. And then she collapses. Faints right in his fucking arms, dude. Because that's how women react to Father Pharaoh. They just, <laughs> anything to get out of his out, out of his circle of influence. So when she comes to, Pharaoh walks her to her car, and she says that she senses that he is in great danger. She tells him she saw his soul in the cup. <laughs> she says that he's got a great enemy, and that when he saw, that when she saw the evil Lucy wants it, it looked like she was looking into the face of Satan himself. And then, just to end the encounter on an up note, Evelyn tells Pharaoh that the enemy wants his soul. Dun, dun, dun. Now, Pharaoh hates himself so much, he tells Evelyn that he's totally cool with that. <laughs> he's like, if Satan thinks I'm worth destroying, he says, I guess I should be flattered. Like, hey, someone noticed me. Yay. Yay. After Evelyn leaves, because of course Pharaoh lets her drive after she fucking faints at a party, he walks around to the side of the house and just sits down. And that's when we see the shadow of a great king cobra up on the side of the house. It's not just a shadow. It's a foreshadow. It's a foreshadow. <laughs> the next morning, there are two farmers, loggers. I don't know what the fuck they're doing, but they're, they're, they're out in the field chopping wood. And one of the men gets bitten in the leg by a rattlesnake. And the other guy promptly cuts the snake's head off with its axe. But in the brush, we can see the King Cobra watching the whole thing. Meanwhile, Sheriff Tatum, played by John McCurry, tells some local news station about the train that we saw at the beginning. He's like, look, just because two people died on this train that mysteriously stopped in the middle of the tracks, because there's nothing out of sorts about that, it's not going to stop that dog track from opening. Won't stop it. Now we meet Dr. Maggie Sheridan, who's played by Gretchen Corbett. Uh, you might remember Corbett from her small but pivotal role in Let's Scare Jessica to Death, which is a far better film than Jaws of Satan. <laughs> Sheridan's at the hospital dealing with patients, including one who the attending nurse says kept mumbling words that sounded like steak or quake. <laughs> quake and steak. Whoop, quake. <laughs> quake or steak and lube? What could, oh my god. <laughs> And I'm thinking, what kind of fucking PBS kids show is this? Qua, ache, quake. <laughs> so on her way to the hospital's morgue, Sheridan runs into Father No Fun. He's there to visit the farmer that got bitten by the snake. And when the father goes to see the guy, Sheridan talks to the pathologist. The pathologist shows Sheridan the body of one of the guys from the train who was bitten in the face by a snake. Sheridan says that she's seen a lot of snake bites, but she's never seen anything like that. So she wants to warn the townspeople that there might be some riled up snakes in town, but the pathologist is like, mm, you'd best not. Matt Perry would not like anything messing with the opening of that racetrack. Well, nonetheless, Dr. Sheridan calls in an expert herpetologist from the local university. Herpetologist. I, that fucking word, dude. It's like... I love it. How do you know so much about herpes? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but before the herpetologist could look at the corpse, the mayor had him fucking cremated because dog track. Right. She tries to take... The, the herpetologist, whose name is Paul, his name is Paul Hendricks, she's like, where do you see this? Where do you see this weird snake bite that I'm not sure about? There's two holes in his face. Isn't that weird for a snake bite? Um, <laughs> but yeah, she can't find the body because the mayor had it shipped off to be cremated. Now, in the farmer's hospital room, the victim's son says his father was bitten by a rattlesnake, but it was different. It stood up on its tail and kind of remained standing, even after the kid cut its head off. In fact, he brought the snake's body with him to the hospital. And Hendrix, the herpetologist, looks at it. He's like, yep, that's a snake, all right. <laughs> Just a big, enormous, diamondback rattlesnake. No big deal. 
Now, while this is going on, Father Pharaoh's laying the... He's back at his rectory, house, church-owned trailer. I don't know. But... um. The priest cave. The priest cave. <laughs> He's laying the worst kind of ecumenical counseling on some poor kid that looks like Don Scardino and Squirm. <laughs> Apparently, the kid got busted smoking a jazz cigarette or something, but Pharaoh tells him not to do drugs, but to, quote, try God. He could be quite a trip, too. Oh, my God. How is that not just the worst fucking don't-do-drugs line Ever. Has that ever helped anyone? Never helped me. And the kid's like, uh, yeah, okay. Well, we haven't seen you at Mass lately. Yeah, that's because I'm fucking doing acid. <laughs> and I'm meeting God, so you can piss off. Um, well, after the obviously desperate drug addict leaves the house, town witch Evelyn calls Father Pharaoh from a payphone at a local diner, and she tells him she understands everything now. She knows who the enemy is, but she can't talk about it over the phone. After all, a snake might be listening. <laughs> Evelyn makes Pharaoh promise not to leave the house that night so she can come over and explain everything. And I'm like, the fuck's he going to do? He's, he's a priest. He's going to drive over to the next county and ban dancing? Nobody <laughs> wants him over for a fun game of win, lose, or draw. It's the crucifixion. Well, good, but the card says you were supposed to draw an onion, Father. So, obviously, you've fucked this up completely. Paul, the herpetologist, is like, well, there's really nothing here. This snake's dead, and it's a snake, and I guess it bit this guy. I'm going to go ahead and take off. But the taxi he's in gets cut off by an ambulance. It's Dr. Sheridan driving it. She says that there's been another snake attack, and this time she's got the proof. And it's in the back of the ambulance, a vehicle that she says she hijacked. <laughs> like you do. Dude. <laughs> you can't do that. <laughs> there are... the, the cops would have found her by that point. Oh, there are laws. <laughs> Specifically about that, I'm pretty sure. So when Sheridan pulls out the gurney, she reveals the victim's face. And it's Evelyn, the town witch. Once again, she's been bitten in the face. Mark says he hasn't seen this kind of toxin before, so he decides to stay to help get to the bottom of the mystery. Now, look, what the fuck does it take to be an expert? <laughs> I don't know, but I love how Doc Sheridan calls it a fucking epidemic. Three right. bites. Three, three snake bites. bites. It's an epidemic. Hendrix and Sheridan both claim to have seen hundreds of snake bites. And Hendrix is a fucking herpetologist, and yet they are both befuddled by the snake bites in their town. Look, I mean, they were all bitten by rattlesnakes. How in the fuck do you call yourself an expert on snakes, but you can't figure out that a rattlesnake was responsible, even when the farmer's kid shows you the headless body of a fucking rattlesnake? That's circumstantial, but good, just fucking barely. Just barely. Well, now the whole town is paranoid. Well, there's a big kerfuffle in town because there's a rattlesnake in the town hardware store. So Sheriff Tatum goes into the store with his gun drawn to hunt that sucker down. And I have never seen a hardware store that stocked that many sleeves of Oreos or tins of Vienna sausages. Me neither. But the sheriff shoots the fucking snake. How do you shoot a snake when it's moving around like that? He must have real good aim. Right. And obviously, the crisis is now averted. The snake is dead. We can keep the beaches open over Labor Day weekend. That's awesome. Woo. Sheridan lets Paul borrow her car. He drops her off at her house, and he goes to the only hotel in town. Sheridan's house. Good gods. <laughs> so much wood paneling. You know, that whole house smells like Florence Henderson's cooter. Oh, I'm sure. Just like Lemon Pledge and Pine Sol. Right. So she goes upstairs to the bedroom and gets ready to take a shower. However, we can see the shadow of the King Cobra on her bedroom wall, and it's watching from outside through the window. And inside her bedroom is a gigantic rattlesnake. <laughs> and, and, and this is one of the slowest scenes of danger I have ever watched. It fucking takes her forever to get undressed, and we still don't see her naked, but she takes off a shoe. Yeah. 
And then 15 seconds later, she takes off another shoe and she's staring at herself in the bathroom mirror. And while she's doing that, the rattlesnake crawls into the tub. Now, does she not have peripheral vision? (laughs) That's what I want to know. How do you not fucking see that? She puts her hand into the shower, and without looking, she turns on the water, and the snake's waiting for her to get into the tub, but it's taken her so fucking long, (laughs) the snake gets tired of waiting and goes out into the bedroom. If this is supposed to create tension, it does not. It does not. It just frustrates me. So Sheridan takes a shower that's about eight seconds long, and then it takes her five more minutes to take the hairpin out of her hair and put on a bathrobe and walk into the bedroom. (laughs) So she slips on her nightgown, she gets into bed, and that's when she sees the snake, and she's terrified. Backing up against the headboard, she's making monkey noises. Something. I just love how she's giving Paul, the herpes expert, all these like sexy signals, and he completely is oblivious And so she goes to bed, and a giant fucking snake joins her instead of him. While the snake is crawling towards her, she stops making monkey noises for a minute, (laughs) and she actually calls Paul at the hotel. Now get this. Paul leaves the hotel, gets into the car, drives out to her house, which is apparently out in the fucking woods of Utah, Alabama, and in all that time... The snake is still slithering towards Dr. Sheridan. (laughs) It's a big bed. (laughs) In reality, she'd be fucking dead by now. But he gets there and he has to break in. With a hunk of wood. He breaks the back door with a hunk of wood. And then runs to her bedroom, which he just somehow knows where it is. I don't know. He's never been in there. (laughs) I guess he figured, well, it's probably not this room with the toilet in it or the stove. (laughs) I guess so. Well, he's got one of them telescoping poles with the hooks on it that you use for catching snakes. And I guess, you know, when you're not catching snakes, what do you do with that? You just, you can use it to make s'mores, I reckon. I don't know. I guess, but he's not very good at this. He's not. And well, the snake is apparently superhumanly strong. It's super snaky strong. And he's struggling with it. Like, he's got the, 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 the hooks on the pole wrapped around the snake's neck, and he's trying to back it up to the wall. But he can't. It's like fighting him. And it's like watching somebody pretend to fish. It is. He's like shaking the pole. His facial expression never changes, though, which is great. It's always just like, I don't know why my agent said this is a good idea. So it takes him another two, three minutes to back the snake up against the wall. And then he tells the doctor, let me borrow your gun. How do you know she has one? What if she didn't? So anyway... She does, and he takes the gun, and he blows the top of the snake's head off. So if you're not into animal violence, this looked real. I could be wrong. He shoots the top of the snake's head off. Not even the entire head, just the, just top, the top of it. Of it. It, just, it just pops. Like somebody put a fucking firecracker inside the snake's mouth, and it's, it just blew off the top of the head. It's like the tiniest caliber bullet ever. It's so weird. Because even a twenty two would have taken that thing's head all the way off, but no. no. It's like maybe he just barely grazed the top of the snake's head and just yeah, got it, lucky. It, I don't know, man. It was an air gun or something. Anyway, this at this point Doc Sheraton goes fucking hysterical. She's screaming and crying, and he slaps her. Just slaps the shit out of her. And her response is to slap the shit out of him right back, and I'm like, yes. The the, the cobra's shadow on the wall disappears after he shoots the snake, and you can almost hear the cobra be like, aww. But after Paul and Sheridan slap each other, um, they don't kiss. And like you said earlier, I'm pretty sure she's flirting with him, and he is completely unfazed by her advances. I mean, she could have grabbed his cock at that point, and he would have asked where the nearest pizza place was. (laughs) Yeah, but he ends up staying the night anyway. He does. And the next morning, they're eating breakfast together on the back porch, and there should be glass everywhere from the door that he broke the night before, but there's not. It's fine. The <laughs> the, the door is miraculously hailed, so I'm not really sure how that happened. 
Father Pharaoh's housekeeper tells him that Evelyn was found dead, and he's like, well, I guess that's why she didn't come over last night. Wah, wah, wah. Pharaoh takes it upon himself to walk to Dr. Sheridan's house. He goes into her backyard and interrupts Sheridan and Paul while they're having breakfast. She's even like, what's he doing here? Because it's fucking weird. <laughs> you don't fucking do that. So Sheridan tells the priest that Evelyn was killed by a snake because, you know, fuck confidentiality. Okay, um, this was before the HIPAA laws were signed, but still, show some fucking decorum. Paul says he's been studying wounds for 20 years, but he can't identify what kind of snakes been killing people. And again, it just seems like rattlesnake bites would be the most basic kind of fucking bite you could study. That's like Dang. Snake 101. It's like finding someone who's obviously been shot and saying, well, I just can't tell what general form of weapon created this giant hole, this human being. <laughs> So Dr. Sheridan goes to tell the mayor about the killer snakes, but he refuses to listen. She chief Brody's him. He mayor Larry Vaughn's her, because after all, dog racing means friendship. So here comes the next exposition dump. Father Pharaoh's uncle just happens to be the Monsignor. Now, the Monsignor tells Pharaoh that his father didn't die in the war, as he had been led to believe, but that he killed himself. Pharaoh's father had said that something was after him, and when they found him, he was terribly mutilated, and we take our mutilations very seriously in this part of the world, and that there was a straight razor in his hand. So the Monsignor begins tra began to trace the family tree, just like Evelyn the Town Witch, apparently. <sighs> I guess when you meet Father Pharaoh, your first thought is, how, is, how did he get to be so boring? Is this genetic? Yeah. <laughs> Is there some family trait that just makes him less interesting than a scarecrow? Is that, is that what's happening? The Monsignor found out that Father Pharaoh, as well as the rest of his family, was descended from St. Patrick. Yeah, <sighs> that one. Okay. okay. Shh, shh, shh. This is where it gets dumb. Cootie Bug, can you explain this curse? Oh, my God. I don't even know if I can. So apparently, Father fucking Melancholy here was descended from St. Patrick, like you said, and St. Patrick drove the snakes out of Ireland and pissed off the druid priest, and the priest cursed him, and now Satan is fulfilling a druidic curse, because that makes sense. Did druids have churches? No, they didn't have fucking churches. Well, the Monsignor says the St. Patrick burned all the druid churches. <sighs> I guess give it a name. So druids have invoked <laughs> Satan. <laughs> Something bad happens every third generation to a member of this family. That's the only other thing that I would add to that. I don't even know why it fucking matters, okay? So the Monsignor says that if Satan has indeed descended upon their tiny Alabama town, there should be signs, like uh, billboards or something. No, <laughs> like, like, like strange things should be happening in nature. Satan has Father Pharaoh in his sights, and Pharaoh is such a fucking drag that he's actually an easier target for the devil. The Monsignor says that Pharaoh exudes despair and sadness, He's basically the Eeyore of the Catholic Church. He is. His greatest weapon against the devil is his faith in God, the Monsignor says. And if he can't bring that out, then it's over. And this is a great line from the Monsignor. A priest would make a bright flame in hell. <laughs> and this makes Pharaoh even sadder. He, like, gets more depressed about that. I mean, please, will somebody get this guy, like, a fucking balloon? Or, like, an edible arrangement? There you go. A Chili's gift card? Something. <laughs> After a snake attacks two horny teens, the sheriff tells his deputy to go hunt for the snake in the brush because, you know, rattlesnakes don't have natural camouflage or anything like that. Just go out there and stuff around. Look for it. He's got a gun. He can shoot the snake. Sure. <laughs> All cops can shoot snakes. We've learned... <laughs> snakes are easy. To <laughs> easy to shoot. Just shoot it, man. Shoot it in the head. <laughs> Meanwhile, the sheriff's looking around in some dilapidated structure. The deputy, who's actually doing the real work out there in the underbrush, hears something rustling around and making sounds. So he pulls out his gun, and then suddenly a small black child walks out. And she just says, <laughs> hi. <laughs> Keep walking. 
Yeah, but then he turns around and gets bit in the face by a snake. He died literally 15 seconds later. Yep. Apparently, the black girl was like, I see that snake. I'm getting the fuck out. Nope. Smart. Bye. Smartest Smart person kid. in town. No kidding. <laughs> so the deputy's been bitten. Father Pharaoh is at the cemetery. He is officiating Evelyn's funeral. And his message is more depressing than usual. He actually says, she's dead now. Thank you for those words of hope and inspiration, you fuck. So he goes on about how you can't understand God, and you can't understand life, and you can't understand death. You can't understand anything, really. So why try? (laughs) Yeah, why try? But hooray for all of God's mercies. This is not helpful. (laughs) This comforts no one. I want to know why the town witch got a Catholic funeral. That was my next question. It doesn't make a bit of sense. (laughs) I don't want a Catholic funeral. I don't either. (laughs) But yeah, full bore Catholic funeral for the witch. Didn't we used to burn them? (laughs) After everybody leaves the, the, the graveside service, Pharaoh kneels down by her coffin and his golden crucifix falls off his neck. And then the Monsignor approaches... And here's Info Dump 3. He's got this giant book. He says the book is the Pharaoh family history. Now, one of the members of the family back in the day, who was a priest, was successful in defeating the demon, but there were conditions. That guy was wearing holy raiment, but he was, quote, without ornament. And the book also says that the demon was defeated by a golden sign. So... McDonald's? Very vague. Then the cobra shows up in the cemetery because fuck consecrated ground if you're the devil snake, I guess. And the cobra chases Father Pharaoh and the Monsignor through the cemetery. And when the Monsignor has to stop to rest, the cobra crawls right over his feet and focuses its energy on Father Pharaoh. Being the epitome of graceful and lithe movements... Father Pharaoh falls into an open fucking grave, and the cobra hisses and slithers at him, kind of thrusting towards him when he tries to climb out. But Pharaoh grabs a loose section of fencing, which just so happens to be in the shape of a cross. Now, the snake hates that shit and crawls away. Also, the Monsignor has a heart attack. He's dead now. (laughs) I want to know why the car couldn't go into a cemetery, but the... King Cobra can. You are reading my mind. <laughs> the Cobra should have just stayed at the edge and hissed at them or something. And somebody should have just somebody should have called that snake cat poo. Yep. <laughs> Meanwhile, the doctor and Paul, the herpes tologist, have called an impromptu town meeting to talk about the rash of snake attacks, and there's a lot of mumbling, mumble, 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 mumble. And the mayor crashes the meeting and he brings the coroner with him. Father Pharaoh kind of sneaks in the back, having escaped the devil snake and crawled out of an open grave. Didn't go home, just went straight to the fucking town meeting. Um, where was I? Oh, yeah, the mayor. He's got the coroner with him. Oh, also, Father Pharaoh apparently just left his uncle's body in the cemetery. Just leave him there. It's fine. It's f- I mean, M- maybe, maybe he kicked him into the open grave. He's going to wind up there anyway, right? Yeah. I mean, he yeah. is dead. So yep. Save some steps. Right? Just... <laughs> <laughs> there you go Dominus, corner's busy anyway Dominus Nabisco the mayor tells everybody to calm down because Sheriff Tatum killed the snake in the hardware store obviously that was the snake that has bitten now what five people mm-hmm. when the crowd asks him how Evelyn the town witch died the coroner says that she died of anaphylactic shock from a bee sting under her eye he's mm-hmm. obviously lying this was no beating accident. Father Pharaoh stands up and says he was almost killed by a cobra at Evelyn's funeral. Well, that gets the mayor's dander up. So he pulls Pharaoh, and Sheridan, and Paul into a meeting, and Matthew Perry's there too. And the mayor says, look, I'm going to put the town under curfew. While everyone's inside, you all take whoever you need and look for those snakes. And if you find the snakes, kill them. But if you don't, Keep your mouth shut about it. And Perry he says you have 18 hours to kill the snakes before the track opening. And Perry, who I forgot was there until just now, says that if his dog racing track doesn't open without a hitch, he'll throw everyone in jail. And he tells Father Pharaoh, I'd lock up the Pope if he tried to screw up this deal. <laughs> I feel like that's a line you would only hear in Alabama. <laughs> that seems right. 
So why are snakes considered evil? Because the snake was the original tempter in the Bible. So now every snake is evil? I guess so. It was part of the part of the curse, I think. When God kicked Adam and Eve out of the Garden of Eden, he also cursed the snakes. But druids are okay with snakes, yeah? Well, because they're a symbol of rebirth, the cyclical nature of life. Okay. Like the Ouroboros? Is that a... So yeah. I'm looking at okay. Yeah, I was just curious because well because so far this movie's stupid. Yep. And I was really hoping to get some kind of I don't know research besides the book of Revelations <laughs> to help me out with this. Okay. Paul the herpetologist and some police officers get into a helicopter and Paul's looking for a, a good place for snakes to hang out and you know get a few drinks play some pool. They find a rocky place and set the copter down. And immediately, just in no short order, Paul finds like five aggressive rattlesnakes. And he tells the sheriff that all the snakes seem to be heading in the same direction, like some cor- like some sort of meeting place. And of course, there's a cave nearby. So that has to be it. Now, while they're doing that, Doc Sheridan's driving home. I think home. I don't know. She's driving. Back to town. I don't know where she's going. But this dude on a motorbike who looks like kind of dollar store Michael J. Pollard pulls up beside her and knocks on her window while she's driving. And she rolls down her window. And he's just like, hey, how's it going? But gosh, there's something kind of weird about that guy. No shit. (laughs) Do you think? Soon, the biker pulls out in front of Sheridan's car and forces her to leave the road. And the biker rides down to her and forces her to exit the vehicle at gunpoint. He's a rapey boy, and he shoves the barrel of the gun in her mouth and caresses her breasts with the gun and kneels down in front of her. And I don't know what he was doing when he knelt down. Maybe he's just trying to tie her shoelaces together so she can't run. But she starts making those monkey noises again, like she did when the snake came into her bedroom. And then she screams, but she screams because she sees the cobra. And the biker hightails it the fuck out of there. Sheridan gets back on her car, tries to start it up so she can also get the fuck out of there. But the cobra rears up outside of the driver's side window. And just before the engine turns over, this cobra rams its head into the window and shatters it. And then fucks off. I hope she has insurance. Yeah. (laughs) And it turns out that Perry, dog track man, hired the biker dude to rape Sheridan. Well, I mean, he says he just wanted to frighten her, but come on. That's Gross. like co- that's code for please sexually assault this person until they bleed and concede to my demands because I'm too much of a coward to do it myself. Yep. And what's the deal with class in this town? <laughs> her car window gets busted later. It's fine. Her door, it's fine. Doesn't matter. It's like it never happened. It's like the shoemaker and the elves except it's glaciers. Is that the right word? Window people and the other window people. I don't know. They must have good ones in that town, though. Outside the cave, Paul and the sheriff find a ginormous snake skin. It is huge. And inside the cave are numerous rattlesnakes and the cobra. So if I'm parsing this correctly, the cobra is exerting some kind of reptilian mind control over the rattlers, causing them to attack any human that stands in the way of its evil plan. Yeah. Yeah? I think that's accurate. Okay, good. Well, I'm glad this is making more and more sense. (laughs) Oh, I wouldn't go that far. (laughs) Sheridan and Paul go talk to Father Pharaoh. Pharaoh sketches the snake that he saw at the cemetery, and Paul's like, yep, that's a cobra. (sighs) All those years of education really, really paying off here, buddy. Pharaoh says, okay, but what if it's not just a cobra, but it's actually the embodiment of pure evil? Yeah, and Paul's like, it's just a snake. And Pharaoh says, the snake is Satan. (laughs) He says it just like that. It sounds like he's fucking Tarzan. It's nighttime now, and thank fuck, because maybe this movie's almost over. At the Perry house, Mrs. Perry is giving her husband hell about the dog track. She hates it. She thinks Perry's essentially a vulture and a leech and a bad, bad man for profiting off of gambling. And Perry's defense is, you're living pretty good. You got nice things. Nah, you ain't complained about that. Nah, nah. Meanwhile, their little daughter Kim has snuck outside. It's after curfew. She's in the yard, and she sees a patch of grass kind of moving around and wrestling. She reaches her hands in, 
and pulls out her pet cat named Bandit. When Kim goes back inside, her parents catch her in the act, and Perry's like, oh, it's not a big deal. But Mrs. Perry decides to be just a bitch about the whole thing and grounds Kim so she can't go to the opening of the racetrack the next morning. And what an opening it is! There are dancers, there are baton twirlers, there's a, a, a shitty band. It's everything you would expect from the opening of a waterbed store and more. The mayor shows up with a state senator. Mr. Perry's ecstatic to see the den of iniquity that he's created, but then who should arrive but Kim? She just cruises up on her little puffy. Sheriff Tatum asks Kim if he should page her folks, but she's still grounded, so she's like, no, I'm fine. It's okay. Well, the sheriff lets her in. But when she sees her parents headed her way, Kim decides to hide in a janitorial closet. Unfortunately, she doesn't see the snake that is also in the closet, and it immediately bites her on the leg. (laughs) She's not there for two minutes, dude. (laughs) Right? So she stumbles out of the closet screaming, and her parents take her to the on-site medical clinic. Meanwhile, outside the dog track, the sheriff drops Paul off in the woods near the entrance of the snake cave, but says, I gotta get back to the dog track. Paul's cool with that. And he tromps up the hill until he finds the cavern, and he kind of strolls on in with nothing but a camping lantern, which is awesome and brave, until he slips and falls down an incline, landing just inches away from a puddle filled with over a dozen rattlesnakes. (laughs) Now, at the local Catholic church, which should have been called St. Patrick's, but I don't know for sure. Oh, my God. That would have been fucking funny. Father Pharaoh is preparing to serve communion. Now, before he snaps the host into pieces and begins the dispensing of the body and the blood, he seems to get a vision, and he stops what he's doing, and he says the word, caverns. <laughs> and then he bails on the service. <laughs> he, he looks up, and he sees this weird stained glass window that I'm pretty sure is just a fucking Illuminati third eye. Yep. It's a big eye inside a pair. Is that a thing in Catholic churches? I don't know. I've, I've only ever been in, like, two, I think. Okay. Yeah, I've been in one. I've never seen that. Either way, he walks right the fuck out of that church, just leaving pews filled with confused cathols in his wake. Paul's in the snake cave. He's knocked out in front of, you know, Rattlesnake Lake or whatever the fuck it is. Dr. Sheridan has also gone to the snake cave, presumably to be with Paul, but she is not dressed for any underground adventures. She's wearing a red dress and shoes that I believe would not count as being sensible. Yep. I love it. Who the fuck goes spelunking in a red dress and pumps? So after that, Father Pharaoh walks to the cave, and he goes in, and he goes, Satan! And he yells it again, and he yells it one more time. He discovers Paul lying on the ground next to the rattlesnake kiddie pool, and past that, there's Doc Sheridan in her stylish red dress, lying on a stone altar. And on that rock above the altar is the King Cobra. I think this is supposed to be threatening. (laughs) I think we are supposed to fear for Doc Sheridan's future. That does not happen. It's not that we want her to die. It's just that we know she knows better. Mm -hmm. Everyone in this movie knows better. (laughs) The viewer isn't frightened so much as they are disgusted at the poor decisions made by every single character in this movie. (laughs) Oh, 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 shit. Uh, Kim, the little girl, she's given anti-venom at the racetrack and rushed to a nearby hospital. And when Mr. Perry says he'll go with her, his wife's like, you stay here at the racetrack. You just think about what you've done. She says, think about what you almost paid for it. Even though our daughter was grounded and she broke the (laughs) rules by sneaking out of the house to attend the opening of the dog track, it's your fault that our daughter got bitten by a snake inside the closet. (laughs) Back to the cave. Father Pharaoh and the King Cobra are having some kind of weird stare down. (laughs) It's like psychological battle. So Pharaoh lifts Sheridan off of the altar, tells her that you're not the one the snake wants. So he lies down on the altar. He takes off his crucifix and he lays it on the ground. And it's kind of a standard, take me, take me sort of situation. Pharaoh's praying and speaking in Latin and sweating because he's wearing that holy dress over his street clothes. And then suddenly a shaft of light appears in the caves. It could be sunlight. It could be the awesome power of God. I don't know. It could be Paul's camping lantern. (laughs) 
What is it? What is the light that comes into the cave? I assumed it was sunlight somehow. I don't know. There must have been like a crack in the ceiling. Well, that's a very poorly constructed cave, isn't it? (laughs) It is. That's something Mike Holmes would have a fit about. (laughs) Also, who the fuck goes into a cave wearing a red dress? I don't know. Not even boots. It's fucking pumps, dude. Spectator pumps. She's spelunking in pumps. Anyway, the light comes in. Pharaoh reaches over and picks up the crucifix he took off. Thank goodness he left it within fucking arm's reach and didn't just hurl it. (laughs) Smart thinking. So he positions the crucifix. So it's in that shaft of light, and it shines this cross-shaped patch of light directly onto the cobra's chest. Do cobras have chests? (laughs) It's a belly. It's the belly of the snake. It's all belly then. Yeah. The cobra's raised up and its hood is is, is inflated or out. Whatever mm-hmm. the word I'm looking for is. Open. You, in your easy words. Um, <laughs> there's light in the shape of a cross on the snake's belly and it catches on fire, but it doesn't fall. It just looks like a flaming stick. It does. So Sheridan and Paul leave. Father Pharaoh leaves. The snake keeps burning. The orchestra on the soundtrack kind of swells, and that's it. That's the end. That is the thoroughly anticlimactic climax to Jaws of Satan, a movie that proves that there is such a thing as snakes. And then you can see the wire in the flames. You can. (laughs) Swinging. Right before the credits begin, you can see that burning wire. It's like a a Fourth of July sparkler. It is. Just glowing red, and then just kind of slumps over. (laughs) <laughs> to the side. Now, look, I don't know how much money Jaws of Satan made at the box office. I don't think it matters. In some ways, we are just lucky to live in a world where this film exists because it proves that anything is possible. It does. That movie got made. It got distribution. What do you figure the pitch for this movie was? Like, what did the filmmakers say to backers in order to fund this movie? I don't know, but I'll tell you what. Let's ask a random stranger how they would talk investors into making this movie. I mean, people do that, right? They just pick up bringing public phones, right? <laughs> Happens all the time, especially on this show. All right. Well, then, let's punch them three unholy numbers and see who picks up the landline of the damned. Turn up those speaker phones, kids. We're dialing the number of the geeks. <laughs> Hello. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the show the co-host of the Doing the Nasty podcast and one of the first dudes that we ever came into contact with in the podcast world, Mr. Mark Ball. How are you doing today, sir? I'm doing great. It's good to talk to you guys again and uh, hear from uh, yeah all the, uh, the the Kiss the Goat folks that will probably be commenting on this and being like, who's this guy? We don't know who he is. <laughs> Nonsense. I feel like we should have some applause inserted. Right? If you don't know who I am, you really need to go back and listen to that episode uh, about slugs that we did like about three or four years ago, however long that was was ago. I've I've completely, I'm sorry, I've completely spaced the name of that show. It's okay. It was was the Food Chain, which is also the name of a BBC podcast about uh, (laughs) where your food comes from. So I'm sure a lot of people... (laughs) actually clicked on our podcast hoping to hear some refined English person speaking about sustainability. Didn't happen. And they got us. Yeah, they got us instead. <laughs> yeah, Whoops. that Slugs episode is still one of my favorite things that we, we've ever, that I've ever recorded with basically anybody. That, oh. that show is a fucking who You definitely, if you don't know who I am for sure, you definitely need to go back and listen to that one because that is a fucking great recording. It was great. So we're so glad you came back on to this show to talk about this particular movie, which, again, is kind of a nature runs amok movie, but, yeah. ki- but kind of not. So, Mark, here's the scene. You're a filmmaker, and you finally got a meeting with producers, people with money, and they want to know what kind of idea you have for a movie. Tell us how you would pitch Jaws of Satan. Oh, boy. Um, let's see. <laughs> so I'm confused. Was the, So the working title for this movie was King Cobra, correct? Correct. Okay, so, I mean... 
I think at the time, this is a pretty easy sell. Like, a- Animal Run Amok movies are still, I think, like in their pr- pretty much in their heyday. Uh, I would basically tell the producers, so, so this movie's kind of a combination of two things. It's it's a little bit The Exorcist and a little bit Jaws, except for it's snakes instead of a shark, and it takes place in Alabama. Uh, that's, I mean, that's pretty much it in a nutshell. That, that is kind of this movie. There, it's 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 an Animal Run Amok movie with a, with plenty of religious uh connotation injected in there you got your, your giant devil snake which looks a hell of a lot cooler on the poster than it ends up looking in this movie it's it's a little uh a little bit on the d- disappointing side in the actual movie however it, yeah this this could be like a roger carmen thing where you you show him the poster that's got satanic imagery on it, it says king cobra in huge letters at the top and you got like a 30 foot fucking cobra like in the background like we want to build the biggest you know animatronic we want the jaws of giant snakes like animatronic snakes basically and they they didn't quite get that i, I would assume probably one of the producers was like nah i'm pulling out of this this sounds fucking stupid I, you, you don't get my money but uh yeah that's kind of that's kind of the along the lines that i i, I would probably pitch this guy fritz weaver are you fucking kidding we can't cast him He's a human Mr. Ed. <laughs> <laughs> I only really like I, I didn't know him by name when you told me that he was in this. But as soon as I saw him, he is the other guy that's in the segment from Creep Show, the thing in the crate, right? Yes. OK, that's him. He's Hal Holbrook's buddy. OK, I knew I recognized him from somewhere. I'm like, that's got to be the guy from Creep Show. He looks just like him. So out of all the movies that took that classic Jaws formula and attempted to make it work. Is Jaws of Satan one of them? Is it the worst Jaws knockoff that did not involve a shark? Ooh, that's a really good question, because there's like about 500 movies that are Jaws ripoffs that have sharks that are all just complete fucking dog shit. Uh, I don't, and this one probably lands somewhere kind of in the middle, I would say. This isn't like... This, this is no slugs, which I don't know if I'd really call that like a, a, a snakes or a Jaws ripoff per se, but they're kind of similar movies. Uh, it's not quite on that level, but yeah, this is no uh, Sharknado. This isn't um, Cruel Jaws. Like this is this is, this is kind of somewhere in the middle. They, they clearly didn't have like way a lot of money on this movie. I don't think. I think they blew their money on the cast, kind of. So the effects are a little bit dodgy, but. Uh, this movie is not without its merits. I, I watched this twice in preparation for this, and uh, you they, they were, did what? Well, I watched it last night after a few beers, and I was like kind of struggling to stay awake through it. So I watched it again, like pretty much right before we got on this call to kind of get the more uh, the more refined view of it. I guess I guess you'd say. And I didn't hate this movie. I, it's it's not great, but it's not like the worst thing I've ever seen by a country mile. Okay, my personal benchmark, my high watermark for nature run amok movies is probably Grizzly. Oh, yeah. Grizzly's fucking great. So on a scale of one to Grizzly, where would you put Jaws of Saint? Uh, This is a pretty solid, like, six, I'd say. Yeah, I was thinking that, too. Five or six. Kind of right in the middle on this one. When you're afraid, do you make monkey noises like Dr. (laughs) Sheridan did? (laughs) Or do Um, you make some other kind of horrific sound? I, I, th- I think I get a little more guttural with it and like, yeah, just kind of, kind of growl like a fucking grizzly bear when things really piss me off. I don't, yeah, I don't, uh, I don't know what the hell he was doing in this movie. I, I, don't, I don't know what his motivation was. You're, you're one of the flying monkeys from fucking Wizard of Oz and you're being attacked by a snake. Go with it. <laughs> Are you personally afraid of snakes? Absolutely. fucking <laughs> Yes. I am fucking super afraid of snakes, and I think the primary reason for that is I grew up out in the countryside where uh, you don't really see a lot of snakes until you're like about a gnat's ass away from stepping on one, and then yeah. they just kind of zip off into the grass and scare the living shit out of you. That's my primary experience with snakes. We used to get them in our garage a lot, too. They would just kind of, like, my dad would leave the garage door open while he's out there working or whatever, and big, big-ass big bull snake or whatever would just wander on in there. And Thankfully, my dad is much braver than I and would just, you know, walk over and scoop these fuckers up and throw them back out into the prairie or whatever. But, yeah, I'm pretty... I really don't like snakes. They're weird. Like, everything about them is weird. They, they move really unnaturally because they don't have fucking legs. They have really crazy color patterns like to help them blend into their environment. 
And uh, some of them can kill you super fucking quick with like just a single bite or whatever. Like maybe not so much. We get big rattlesnakes out, out in our neck of the woods out here. But a lot of the snakes are like fairly harmless. We get a lot of like bull snakes and garden snakes and stuff that, you know, eat mice. And that's about it. Like they don't really bother anything. But uh, yeah, they're just really weird animals and they creep me the fuck out. I found one in a bag of potting soil. Did you see that picture that I? I did see the picture. That would have fucking terrified me. I would have just quit gardening then and there and said, (laughs) "Fuck it, it ain't worth it." It was a baby. It was only like maybe twelve to fourteen inches long. Yeah, but it's the the unexpected factor. Like I'm sure you weren't (laughs) expecting to find a snake in a fucking bag of. Uh -uh. I thought it was a big worm, and I reached down and gra- went to grab it with my fingers and realized when it was slithering away from me that that was Ugh. not a fucking worm. Nice. <laughs> you thought that was a big worm? I did. I thought it was a worm. <laughs> You've seen Squirm way too many fucking times. Who are you talking to? You're just all like, no? shit, twerk nothing. Got no <laughs> thumb. God damn. No, true story. Once a year out here at the shrine, there's a night. And it's usually in the mid-spring where we smell cucumbers really strong. And this has happened two years in a row. And cucumbers is supposed to be, if you smell that, that means copperheads are near. Oh, really? And this just smells like a fucking horde of copperheads is somehow crossing in front of or under the house. And it's freaky and it scares me every time it happens. Holy shit, yeah, that sounds terrifying. <laughs> Have you ever been the victim of snaky mind control? <laughs> Not that I know of. And there's and there's the key, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. I, if I was, I don't know if I I don't know how I would know. I mean I'm, I'm, I'm sure the, the evolution's way of, like, keeping the snakes safe in the wild is also making them super freaky. So, that, I mean, that's kind of, that kind of goes, it's it's more, it's more a psychological thing than, like, I feel like any, they could cause a whole lot of physical harm. It's more like they just have a really good way of just scaring the shit out of you. Is this movie Christina Applegate's finest hour? <laughs> um. Because she was, like, what, seven Tan. she's kind of great in this like when she gets bit by the snake i'm i'm pretty convinced that like she's she's screaming bloody fucking murder and is frankly a lot more convincing than some of the other people in this movie so uh yeah. I, she's she's good in this i will definitely give her that i think she's underselling it yeah <laughs> i mean <laughs> she screamed like her leg had been actually eaten like it had been removed from her body and there was just a jagged stump left that's how she acted and i'm pretty sure i would be way worse yeah i I mean (laughs) that's fair finally mark are you now or have you ever been the victim of a druidic curse again god i hope not because i don't know if i would know or not i I don't know any you know you know out 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 and out druids for sure i mean maybe i do i'm I'm not entirely sure actually believe it or not my formal training was in a druidic coven yeah yeah they called themselves druidic i'm not convinced there was much druidism going on but that's that's the official the official thing as i i actually have been through the process and received an initiation as a druidist that's pretty cool it didn't have shit to do with saint patrick did it well no because fuck that guy (laughs) I mean, do you have, like, telepathic control over snakes? <laughs> Not that I know of. No. I should try. I might be a parcel mouth. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that's why me and the black snake in my potting soil got along. It was a closed bag of potting soil. So he'd probably been in there for a while. It had yeah. been in there, and I don't know, we don't know what it was eating. Just worm castings or... Uh, something. Ground up seashells, but all of a sudden she opened it up. She's like, ah, look at this. And she took a picture and sent it to me. And I was like, what the fuck is that? Why, why is this here? Yeah, I would have been terrified. Oh, my God. It was awful. All right. So overall, okay, so you, you, you give it a six, but give us any final thoughts about Jaws of Satan. So my first watch through this uh I, I thought this is a deeply fucking weird movie. It's it's kind of all over the place. And like even like 
Uh, even even like the cold open with the dudes on the train that are like uh, smuggling. Well, I guess they're not really smuggling. They, they they it sounds like they kind of like sell or transport animals for the circus. Basically, they're car- they're carny pieces of shit, is what it is. Yeah, basically, yeah. They're they're like playing dice and getting drunk and stuff. And yeah, for some reason, the dude here's a, here's a rattling in the other car, goes to check, and the fucking snake busts out of the giant. Uh, lock box that it's hanging out in and bites him right in the face. Well, I don't know if it bites the first guy, but it definitely like spooks him enough that he very comically falls out the side of the car door <laughs> and fucking lands real hard like outside. And then it goes and bites the other guy. Uh, I actually think that's kind of a cool cold open. It's it's like lit really interesting and the music is kind of spooky. It's, it's especially the car like where all the dogs are in the cages and stuff. It reminds me of the thing. It's, I think it's the lighting is where it's all at. It's just that one like goofy overhead light, basically, and everything else is kind of in shadow and in darkness. But it's very fluorescent until that one door slides open, and then it becomes super argento. Yeah, yeah, just big old red neon light pouring through exactly. there. Exactly. Little, little little touches, some spooky synth sound, and yeah, you're <clears throat> you, the, yeah. When I first watched this last night, I was like, what the fuck is this movie? But like today, I was like, all right, that's kind of a cool cold open that like kind of sets the mood and is i think maybe one of the spookier parts of this movie which is kind of bad because you don't want that to be the first thing that people see i guess but yeah i i I dug this movie quite a bit i think it's it's supremely fucking goofy uh some some of the acting is not great and it's kind of like pacing and tonal wise it's kind of all over the place because yeah we get our like monster movie open kind of and then it like goes to like a party with a bunch of stuffy old people talking about like town politics basically and like telling the mayor to fucking quit yapping about politics type shit and there's a little little talk of witchcraft with the lady that claims to be the local witch and she actually seems kind of legit because she's like yeah crystal balls are bullshit uh (laughs) she she she, kind of comes off as like i think like a little bit more of a legitimate witch and it's not done i wouldn't say super stereotypically but then this movie is like in a zillion different directions like all throughout the rest of it we got our Main character, like the, is she like a doctor, basically, I think. The one who hijacks the ambulance, because that's legal? Yeah. Yeah, and she's little, a doctor. <laughs> she, yeah, she's uh, she's got slightly questionable morals as a doctor, but, you know, she wants to get the job done. She's, she's, she's the... She's the one of the few smart people in this movie that I think knows exactly what's going on. And then, you know, we get everybody else that is basically the mayor of Jaws and is saying, oh, we got to open this fucking dog track, question mark. Like, what the fuck? Like, I mean, I, I guess it's not. I don't know. I, I, it's, uh, I guess in small towns, dog tracks are a big deal or something. I don't, I don't really understand what the hell is going on with a lot of that why that's such a big deal but yeah he he gives the doctor and the snake expert and like the sheriff or whatever the ultimatum of you you've got 18 hours to clean up all the snakes in this town before the dog track opens before we'll open the beach again basically (laughs) i I guess or maybe everybody in this town just has a horrendous gambling addiction they do they do kind of mention that at some point in this movie where like uh it's the line he's like uh, gambling makes a few people rich and a lot of people really poor. So uh, I guess this is a good thing for this fucking town. I don't, again, I don't really understand the logic, but uh, yeah, this, this, this movie's kind of fucking all over the place. We got giant snakes, we got Satanism. Uh, there's a dude that like runs the doctor lady off the road in her blue Jeep Wagoneer. And is like trying to get a little, uh, a little gross with her, and then the fucking snake shows up and scares him off. And I'm just like, all right, I don't know what the hell the point of this whole entire scene was, except for to get her to the snake, I guess. But yeah, it gets to big. highlight how much of a sleaze ball the mayor is. Yeah, I, yeah. <laughs> This movie is all over the place. I, I wouldn't really call this like a bad movie. It's just very kind of it feels like about five different movies all thrown in a blender and kind of just blah up on the screen, basically. So is this something you'd recommend like to friends? Uh, certain friends. I remember <laughs> when I found out that the, the alternate title on this was King Cobra. I remembered that on the uh, podcast under the series summer series when we did the 80s. I think I was on the year that this one came out, and I'm pretty sure Jerry Herring brought this up at some point because he loves his big monster movies. So 
uh, that's what I was like, okay, I'm kind of vaguely familiar with what this movie is. And uh, in hindsight, this doesn't deserve on a like best of that year list at all. But uh, <laughs> um, yeah, so, yeah, people that are into like monster movies basically or like animals run amok movies, I think you probably enjoy this at, at the very least. Also, fuck yes, Jerry Herring. Yeah. <laughs> he knows Shut his monster up, movies for sure. Yes, he does. I love that dude. Mark, my friend, please tell people where they can find you. So these days my main podcast jam is doing the nasty over with Duncan from Podcast Under the Stairs. Uh, doing the nasty as part of the Teapots Collective, which is all of his like side projects kind of outside of the main uh, podcast under the stairs feed that's over at teaputzcast.com and yeah there, there's a couple other really great shows on there i've been jamming some what the fuck is it called opera omnia where he does like the director uh run throughs like per season and uh yeah this last one was him and bo ranstall doing all of the david fincher movies which i thought were pretty fucking great um but yeah you can find doing the nasty over there this is this is season two i kind of took over co-hosting duties uh when andy blockley said that he couldn't come back for the for season two which is the tier three video nasty list so these aren't like ones that necessarily like people weren't going to jail for renting these out but a cop could still walk into a video store in the uk at this time and steal these fucking movies and have them burned so it's uh, I, I kind of refer to it as like some of the best and worst movies that the BBFC banned in the fucking 80s, because the uh, the quality of the movies that are on this list are kind of all over the place. There's great stuff like the original Dawn of the Dead and Suspiria and Deep Red and Shogun Assassin. And then there are movies that will make your fucking eyes bleed. They're so fucking bad, like uh, Invasion of the Blood Farmers and uh the love butcher which is a movie i absolutely fucking loathe we just did one a couple months ago that's called bloodlust aka mosquito the rapist which is a belgium movie about a vampire and it's so fucking bad that it made me want to burn my house down it's it's an interesting show to say the least the movies are all kind of randomized we're not doing them in any kind of order i think duncan just fed the titles into a randomizer and we do two a month and uh yeah it's it's an interesting show. It's something different every month. I, I think the last episode that came out was Extro, which is super fucking banana pants. It's the movie where everybody did all of the cocaine. Um, <laughs> and uh, The Aftermath stars a fairly young Sid Haig, and it's kind of a post-apocalyptic thing that's uh, very low budget, but really impressive by its low budget standards. Uh, and, uh, both those movies are on YouTube, if you're curious or they're 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 out there to be found. So, uh, yeah, that that's pretty much my main podcast jam these days. I've made like a zillion guest appearances over the summer. If you follow me on Twitter, that's um, at the fancy mark. I usually post like the 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 uh, podcast guest appearances over on there because I can't rely on Facebook because I end up in Facebook jail like at least every other fucking month. And uh, I think my my. My my ne- I'm trying to be careful because my ne- my next offense is probably going to be 90 days, and that's a long time to be away from Facebook. So, is there any sign of that snake? No, but I mean, honestly, I haven't been looking. I mean, I'm just sitting here with my knees curled up under my chin because if that thing slinks across my toes, I'm going to shit. I will shit my pants, and you will hear it on the show. Have you given it any more beer? Well, yeah, I mean, you know, I don't care to share, but apparently that snake has gone through three pints of beer. Jesus, maybe it's dead from alcohol poisoning. Oh, fucking fantastic. I don't want a fucking dead snake under the couch. (laughs) Would you rather have a drunk snake under the couch? (laughs) Well, I don't like either of those options. (laughs) Okay, well, maybe you should give the snake a snack. A snaky snack? Something like that. That's hard to say. (laughs) <laughs> Snakey snack. Snakey snack. Well, if you're looking to watch Jaws of Satan and really make a night of it, well, we can't stop you from doing that. But hell, dinner, drinks, and a horde of mind-controlled rattlesnakes? That sounds like a good time to me. Let's get a hold of Al and see what he's come up with as a Jaws of Satan-based dish. That could be a different kind of snakey snack. Crank up the fry, Daddy. It's time for Recipes from Hell with Alan McPherson. <laughs> So, uh, how, how long 
has it been since you've actually watched this movie? I guess it was last week, wasn't it? Yes. Oh, my God. So, what did you think of Jaws of Satan? I don't know how or why, but I had never heard of this movie before. This was completely under my radar, which is weird because it's like right in that's my era. Like, this is like an artifact of like the weird shit that I remember that other people don't. And I have to verify that I haven't gone crazy. <laughs> I, I don't know how this slipped me by. This is this completely new to me. Um, so we are happy to have enriched your life. <laughs> yeah, in, in, indeed. Um, and, and what a like a perfect. Oh, we're just going to mash together all the stuff that's popular right now into one movie. <laughs> yep, pretty much. But there's a lot that I liked about it, so I'm not going to complain too much. Oh well, by all means, tell me what you liked about it. I mean, we liked parts of it, but, you know. I'll tell you what. I would have liked to see the movie that was actually not a horror movie version of this. That was just, like, the small town politics of this town where you have, like, iconoclast wacky priest hanging out with with witch fortune teller lady going to cocktail parties. Um, I, would have, I would have watched just a television series based on that alone. Yeah, yeah. They you, they could like it, solve mysteries, <laughs> <laughs> or or just help people out with problems. Yeah, man. <laughs> like you know, the eight team, like, only just a witch and a priest. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Witch and priest. That that would have been great. Like, oh, this was the most like ecumenical, liberal, cooperative religious experience thing. Like when, and they're just all, like all hanging out and drinking, and there's like, uh corrupt business guy fuck you just like we're, we're making we both make fun of you because we know how terrible you are and uh yeah that like all of that stuff was lovely like when they're just hanging around that was just delightful i could have that should have been dragged out through the whole thing um <laughs> it was way more interesting to me than the relationship between the the herpetologist and dr big eyes whatever her name was dr monkey noises i i have some thoughts like I, I have some thoughts about her too, because that was uh, what was it? Gretchen Corbett, yes. the actress. Yes. Who, for me, I know her from the Rockford Files. I knew her from Let's Scare Jessica to Death. Exactly. It's a nice genre film uh, where they started, where they wound up. If you look at this film, uh, if you look at like Gretchen's screen debut in Let's Scare Jessica to Death versus Christina Applegates in this. There's a bit of a career trajectory type of thing. But uh, Gretchen Corbett is was like one of my young, young Al crushes. Oh. If you know me, you know I'm a massive Columbo fan, and she played a character in a Columbo episode. What was it called? Exercise in Fatality where she played the girlfriend of a murderous health spa owner. Was was Roddy McDowell the health spa owner? No, it was, what's his face, from um, uh, from Wild Wild West. Robert Conrad. Yes. She played his like main squeeze, who kind of rejects him halfway through it, and he got arrested because he tied shoelaces wrong. It's real complicated. Uh, <laughs> it was the 70s. Uh, Jesus, I at, haven't seen Columbo since I was a kid. That's hilarious. It's one of my things. It's it's an anti nostalgia thing, but like holy smokes, uh, we we do a rewatch of that show every couple of years, and it just melts my heart every time. But yeah, oh. so Gretchen is like in a bikini, uh, walking around in that, and making Peter Falk feel really uncomfortable uh, for a large portion of it, and that affected my whole my whole life. So uh, it was nice to see her in a leading role, even if the leading role was <laughs> happened to be this. She went from wearing a bikini around Peter Falk to hijacking an ambulance. <laughs> Career goals. That's a leap. That is just that is a step up. <laughs> and it's always nice to see Fritz Weber. It is, but nobody in the movie was pleased to see him. <laughs> They were just like, God damn it. Here comes this fucking priest. <laughs> I don't like gambling. I don't like it. I like this witch girl. 
more booze and put it in my tea. <laughs> he was so melancholy. He was the worst kind of drunk. He he basically needed more like socialite witches to hang around with and drink with. He did. Everybody does, I think. If we had made that a TV show, we could have called it Priestical Magic. No. Yes. You're fired. Damn it! (laughs) What if it's animated and Seth Rogen does one of the voices? What if Seth Rogen does all of the voices? (laughs) I'd buy that for a dollar. Jesus. Outvoted on this show. Fuck, I'm just going to sit back and try God instead of <laughs> booze because you know he could be quite a trip too well I want to hear about Al's sandwich I'm watching this there's no like real hardcore like culinary tie-ins so there's not like snake meat in the sandwich no no because like I don't <laughs> you know if I had access uh, to rattler meat or something maybe I'd consider it but uh, I'm watching this it, Oh, you can probably guess what my favorite line in this whole movie is and what all all of my good graces for this movie might come from. Saints are a lot like pigs. They're appreciated more when they're dead. <laughs> so the moment I hear that, it's like, okay, I got to do something with pork. I immediately went to uh, uh, St. Anthony the Abbot who is the patron saint of uh, swine herds, the patron saint of butchers, the patron saint of uh, bacon. Uh, bacon? Yeah, yeah. There's, he has a laundry list of things that he is the patron saint of. Pustules, skin lesions. It's, <laughs> Catholic, it's, holy hell. And the sad thing is we have so many saints, and they have to do so much double duty. Like, if you had a government and their cabinet was as stretched as Catholics are with the different portfolios they had to have, it would not be an effective government. <laughs> right? You need to have more specialization that Catholic saints have with the stuff that they have sway over. Like, I think the pork products should have been enough, let alone with the skin care and stuff. But apparently it just had something to do that he was, like, treating skin lesions with, like, pork fat potuses or something. Is he the patron saint of Kevin Bacon? I'll have to look into that. I, I, at the very least, we should... This, the current Pope's fairly liberal. I think if we petition him... <laughs> you know, probably make that go. <laughs> I mean, Kevin Bacon might be down. He's willing to admit that he was in a Friday the 13th film now. So, you know. So, I, I go and I think immediately, like, Okay, St. Anthony, what are some recipes associated with him? Because he's like the guy who's in charge of pork. There are no recipes associated with him. None? No, no. So Catholics, not necessarily good at marketing. Um, Guy (laughs) Fieri needs to help these guys out or something because there's like some serious brand synergy they need to do. Anyway, I just figure I got to do something with pork. I'm thinking, I just want to eat a fucking sandwich. Uh, it's been a pandemic. I'm not working. I just like to eat stuff at this point. I don't need to go too crazy. So one of the things that's kept me sane over the last 18 months is a thing called a wedge sandwich. That is like a variation of a pizza or like kind of a calzone that came out of Pittsburgh or not Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. I'm sorry. I, I looked at my notes. I made notes. And my notes uh, looked like Fex's Pencil Viola. But after thinking about it, what it is is Fox's Pennsylvania. So Fox's Pizza Pit in Pennsylvania uh, started this sandwich that they call a wedge, which is basically like two thin crust pizza doughs, par cook, that you slather like cold cuts inside, and you bake them together with cheese, sauce, whatever. And then when that's all melty and good, you take it out and then you put the raw, ing- you sort of like force the raw ingredients into it. 
and then you cut it up and turn it into a sandwich. And it is like the sandwich that will change your life. Uh, <laughs> it sounds ungainly and ridiculous, <laughs> but it eats really well. And it's one of those things that is like kind of kept my powder dry over the last while. So I figured this would be the way to go. At the same time, since this movie was all about like, oh, we'll take a little bit of Jaws. We'll take a little bit of uh, The Exorcist and Satanic Panic stuff. And snakes are scary, I guess. We'll just throw it all into a thing. It's like, all right, I don't need to stop there. I can just throw more stuff in there. <laughs> so you, you, you know the, uh, the Welsh rare bit? Oh, from the um, Gomer Pyle episode that gave him nightmares. Uh, probably. Just say yes, damn it. <laughs> I'm right about that. It's 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 toast and some kind of cheese sauce. It's like a cheese and beer sauce. <laughs> I'm listening. So the the drink, the snake bite, is basically in in the UK is basically half beer, half hard cider. So it's like I could take beer and cider and melt a shitload of cheese into it and turn that into a sauce that then i would take this obscenely pork and pickled onions and sauerkraut sandwich and then dip bits of it into and it would make about as much sense as this movie did (laughs) (laughs) and that's how it went you know just following your train of thought as to how you come up with these things is probably more fascinating than anything else we've talked about on the show. Yep, I love the method to the madness. It's not really like a stream of consciousness, but more like a pinball machine on an unlevel floor consciousness. It's kind of how like my brain works most of the time. You know, there's part of me that just wants to take beer and cider and just pour some shredded mozzarella into it and, mm-hmm. and just knock it back. Jesus Christ. Just call it a a phlegm bite or something. I think you're like extrapolating on the buttered rum concept here. Oh my god. Like you need to do from butter to cheese rum. We're dealing with Catholics, not the Amish. <laughs> <laughs> So what do you think of Satan Cobra? I think Satan Cobra, who somehow ex- exerts his mental powers over the army of rattlesnakes in the town, pretty great. <laughs> <laughs> Can all Cobras do that? <laughs> I love it. It's like, uh, Satan's just out on furlough. Yeah. Right? <laughs> like, every now and then, you got to let Satan out. <laughs> The cobra and he has psychic control of snakes. Just go into a carnival like Satan does. Because why not? The things that people know about me, I think, are I'm an avid Columbo fan and I am big into dog rescue and animal rights. What's with the dog racing subplot? Uh, I, was, I was waiting for that to like make sense the whole time. Does it come together ever? Did I just no. like miss something? No. I think they just needed to have some kind of large event where something bad could happen. And you expected the snakes just to come swarming through the dog track and start snapping, but it doesn't happen. They just bite one little girl, and then you know the mayor's wife gets angry, and that's pretty much the end of it tragic missed opportunity there it it almost seemed to be implying to me that this satan cobra was there to punish the dog racers i think the snakes were there to draw father morose out into the open so that he could walk around the rural areas of the county yelling satan and that i guess that's it it wanted to be a lot more apocalyptic than it actually is i think I guess I just didn't have the money, or I suppose it's difficult to train snakes. I've not tried <laughs> to, to do that. I mean, I this was YouTube, so there wasn't, like, a lot of snake tutorial videos. Yeah. Because <laughs> I'm sure that would be easy. 
right? Just look up a couple of videos. You'll you're good to go. <laughs> yeah, you're fine. I don't think there were any snake whisperers back in 1978. Props to the evil businessman guy. He was seemed to be really open minded about his dog racing thing because he didn't really seem to care like what breeds or sizes. It was just like a bunch of dogs that he was bringing in from all across the country. It was just poodles, just poodles, chihuahuas, whatever. Yeah, that's fine. It's like an open. It was like the early days of MMA. Like, <laughs> It's like a real style battle, right? Towards the end, when Fritz Weaver kind of has his uh, Jake and Juliet blues moment and he sees the light while he's preparing to give <laughs> communion, he looks up and he sees this glass, the stained glass window in the church that has Illuminati third eye. Is that normal in Catholic churches? Like, do they all have that? To my knowledge, us Cathars and Masons and stuff generally don't get along too well. <laughs> So that's pretty weird iconography, man. Um, It's what we were thinking. I mean, was it meant to represent money? Because that would make sense in a church. Oh, here's a big stained glass dollar bill. You know, that's that's fine. But yeah, we were very, very confused by that. Yeah, but like a Roman coin or something, I think, would probably symbolically work better that way. (laughs) There you go. I've never worked in stained glass, but I can imagine it's pretty difficult to make a piece that has 30 pieces of silver. <laughs> oh. So do you think there was any actual animal violence in this movie? Do you think, or were they employing, like, fake snakes? I mean, sometimes sometimes you can tell and sometimes you can't. Like, in the Italian cannibal movies, obviously that was they were really killing those animals. But in this one, I don't think they actually did any. The only time I can think of where it might have been real was when the sheriff shot the rattlesnake off of the feed bag in the back of the hardware store. I, I don't think the, the snake who got the head shot with the dramatic blood shooting out of the neck, I, I'm pretty sure that was an effect. I'm willing to bet a lot of snakes got fucking kicked and hit with stuff. Like, I, I would be shocked if there wasn't on-screen snake violence or, or snake violence in this movie that didn't necessarily make it to screen. I'm willing to bet like a lot of things like got picked up and thrown around because the snake budget wasn't bad. They had quite a few of them kicking around. God, oh, that scene you just referenced where they shot the very top off of the head of the snake. <laughs> it was so great. That was one of my favorite parts in the whole fucking movie. And it was yeah. in slow motion. It was like the JFK rattlesnake just back into the left. <laughs> it was holy hell, so graphic. <laughs> There was so much problem. Like, if it if this movie had just embraced that kind of crazy, yeah, it would have been. But um, like, you're talking about the ending and Father Mopey Pope. Like, where he starts off as this kind of like this swinging weirdo dude who I don't know if he's having a crisis of faith or he's just like I don't know what he's supposed to be at the beginning, but he seems pretty like kind of happy and contented. But I don't know what his like character arc is supposed to be. Yeah, I don't. I don't either. There's, there's a lot of like wacky, crazy stuff that happens, and that's the good stuff. Like you can watch that. Like, you can put that stuff on a loop, building up to the climax, man. That it just peters out. Yeah, because he kind of turns from Father Jack into Norman Vincent Peale, and that's that's disconcerting, isn't it? That's a really strange shift for his character. Yeah, the whole thing is that he's pretty. He seems to be pretty laid back to begin with, and he is told the way he needs to confront Satan's snake is to throw off the formality of the church. And he's pretty not that way to begin with. And he actually kind of gets a little bit more religiously as it goes along. It's a it's a suck and blow scenario. It is. I think that's a prerequisite when you're fighting a, a horde of satanic rattlesnakes is you have to get a little bit Jesus-y with it. <laughs> Either that or flamethrowers. <laughs> that's got my vote. Flamethrowers solve everything. Fuck yeah. Burn it all down. Weeds. Pests. You know, Satan snakes, Satan snakes, invaders from hell, flamethrower that shit. Hell, that's how the King Cobra died at the end with the. (laughs) Oh, God. (laughs) I can't even say it without laughing. (laughs) 
the reflective cross. Oh my god, with the light that came down to the top of a fucking cave. <laughs> like a magnifying glass on an ant. Yep. Oh, my God. Okay, so overall, you'd recommend this to, 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 to people to, to watch? To anybody. To not, like, aficionados of, like, checking out random B-movies that are just kind of, like, weird artifacts. No, no. Moms. Uh, <laughs> First-year film school students. Board of Governors at Criterion. Yeah, line them up. Just everybody. Everybody buckle in because you're going to get... Bad religion, and you're going to get attempted rape, and snake violence, and telepathy. I blocked that out! Ah, Why did that happen? You blocked out Rapey Boy? Because he was sent after her by the race, the, the dog track owner to make her be quieter. I just wanted to scare her. I didn't really mean for you to whip your dinghy out. See, again, there is like there seemed to be this grudge match between dog track owner and Satan Snake. It never really came to a head. Bathtub rape snake. There was that. <laughs> Bathtub oh. rape snake. <laughs> that and the voyeuristic tendencies of the King Cobra, who just like hung out outside the window and waited for something to happen. And then like it never did. So it just kind of slunk away like William Hootkins and hardware. <laughs> ah, beautiful hardware reference. <laughs> Uh, are we still allowed to reference hardware? I reference hardware quite a bit. So, That yes. was the before time, so, yeah. Okay, okay, we're in the clear on that. We're headed right back towards it. I mean, country's a hellscape. I'm going to be out there in the backyard in five years trying to pick up robot heads and <laughs> listening to Iggy Pop on the radio. She's <laughs> going to have a welding gun in, in the greenhouse. Fuck it. We'll be good to go. You used to be a na- good neighborhood. You could go down here with just like a piece of wood or a hammer. Now you need a gun. Yep. I'm just going to be some kind of weird zone drifter with one eye. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I've always said if I get the chance, I would eat the heart of a cobra. And I've always said, that's gross. I mean, how do you do that? <laughs> do, you, do you grill it? No, oh, that would just shrivel it up into a tiny piece of muscle ash. I mean, I'm sure there are different ways to do it, but some people actually pull the heart out of the snake's chest, swallow it while it's still beating, and then the bartender, snake tender, whatever, they put the snake's blood and bile into a shot glass of rice wine, and you drink it. I kind of don't want to do that. (laughs) I would like to drink, though. (laughs) That seems like a great idea, actually. (laughs) Especially if you've just eaten a cobra heart. Well, if you're dead set on watching Jaws of Satan, you might as well get eastbound and down while you're doing it. Let us help you help us help you drink your way through Jaws of Satan with Utah, Alabama's favorite drinking game, Drinking with the Devil, where your love of bad movies meets your disdain for your own liver. Drink every time you wonder if Father Pharaoh was the same guy from the fog. Oh, shit. <laughs> he didn't babble as much. <laughs> Barely. Barely. Oh, my God. Drink every time you see the shadow of the cobra during an allegedly tense scene. Oh, my God. That's so many times. I just love the phrase shadow of the cobra. Shadow of the Cobra. Like this should be, be like a, a like this should be like a yeah a martial arts movie or something. Yeah, yes. yeah. <laughs> Drink each time you find yourself wondering what is off about Doctor Sheridan's face. <laughs> is it her eyes? Is it her nose? Is her mouth too wide? I couldn't figure it out for the whole movie. <laughs> Drink every time Paul seems oblivious to Dr. Sheridan's romantic advances. Every time. He is completely oblivious. Just the whole fucking no movie. No clue. No I'm, clue. I'm pretty sure she just had to punch him and straddle him to get him to finally fuck her. <laughs> 
drink whenever you think Paul Hendricks was in Two Men and a Baby and realize you're thinking of Steve Gutenberg. Oh. <laughs> That's creepily accurate. Yep. Give that boy a perm? Yep. Good to go. Good to go. Was that the Grandmaster Challenge? Oh, no. I came up with three. That's oh, funny. I that didn't is realize. funny. Well, then fuck it. I'll do the Grandmaster Challenge. You do the Grandmaster Challenge. That was great. <laughs> And our Grandmaster Challenge for Jaws of Satan, drink every time the so-called experts say they don't know what kind of snake they're dealing with. (laughs) Lots. (laughs) Boy, oh boy, do we get letters. And sometimes we get numbers. And sometimes we receive arcane symbols branded onto what we can only assume is some kind of skin. Nonetheless, we try to discuss every piece of correspondence we receive, and we like to do that right here on the show. It's time for Casper Wyoming's favorite game of questioning and answering, Ask the Goat, where we answer your questions and you question our answers. What the hell is up with that music? It's epic. It's ridiculous. It's perfect. <laughs> As Cootie rummages through the malevolent mailbag... Rummage, rummage, rummage. This seems like a good time to remind everyone that you can contact us four different ways. Count them four different ways. If you haven't bailed on Facebook yet, and believe us, we understand if you have removed yourself from that hot pile of weird, then please join our Facebook group, Come and hang out with the finest bunch of people on the internet. Do you ever wonder who else listens to Kiss the Goat besides you? You're more than welcome to find out. Do that nifty Facebook group search thing and we'll probably show up. And if you're in the mood to type, or at least thumb, depending on your device of choice, then send us an email. Yes, people still use email. I know this because we have one. Send your questions to thegoatofmadness at gmail.com. Because why wouldn't you? Do you like Twitter? Do you like tweeting on the Twitter? Do you know what a fleet is? No, really. What, what's a fleet? Don't they make enemas? Yeah, but I mean, it's apparently a Twitter thing, too. I don't I don't know. So, hey, tweet us or fleet us, whatever the play calls for, at Hail Satan KTG. Hail is capitalized. Satan is capitalized. KTG is capitalized. But it's all one word. Maybe capital letters don't matter. Maybe I'm old and think these things are still important. Who knows? But give us a holler at Hail Satan KTG on the Twitters. And finally, you can leave us a comment on the KTG Instagram feed, which is at Kiss the Goat Podcast. Nothing is capitalized, but it's also one big long word. We're having tons of fun on the gram, especially since I'm the one running the feed. When you need a break from the zombie clown porn, check us out on your phone. Kiss the Goat podcast on Insta, way more funnerer than the Twitter feed. Trust me. It's not a contest. Yep, keep telling yourself that. Our first question comes from Chris Mounts, who references the movie we covered in episode 52. Per the Antichrist, Chris asks, goat ass eating is bad or only bad if you don't bring enough goat ass for everyone? Is human ass eating approved by Satan? (laughs) Okay, I think... That goat ass eating is classified as bestiality, which would be sex with animals. So I'm not down with humans eating goat ass. I mean, do animals participate in oral sex like humans do? I don't know these things. You figure there's got to be such a thing as like, I don't know, goat foreplay? I would hope so. I would hope so. I mean, I don't know how goats fuck. I I don't. don't either. There may be some just intricate dance of analingus that I mean, that, you, that goats engage in. <laughs> Usually, when I see barnyard fornication, it's already in process. So there's just like mounting and a lot of noises. Yeah, exactly. It never sounds like it feels good. Yeah, it never does. It always sounds like, "What are you doing? This is the worst thing." And then, and then there's a baby, um, or an egg. I don't know. Is it only bad if you don't bring enough goat ass for everyone? I can see where that would be considered rude. Maybe yeah. some kind of social faux pas. Whether human ass eating is approved by Satan, I don't know, and I don't care. <laughs> um, I would think yes. I mean, Jesus, if if Satan approves of goat ass eating, surely he approves of human ass eating too. It's like 
just ass eating across the board. I mean, I eat ass, so yeah. well, I don't care if Satan approves of it or Jesus approves of it. To be honest, <laughs> it's not something that was directly addressed in Scripture, as far as I can tell. There's not, there's not a thou shalt not eat your wife's ass. You know, I still have that Bible uh, pulled up on the inner webs here. I can look it up. Please do a search for ass eating. Uh, yeah, I'm going to do that. <laughs> Oh, sorry, we didn't find any results for your search. The King James Version of the Bible has no references to ass-eating, so... Well, as we all know, the King James Bible is the only one that counts. Yep. <laughs> we have no reference to answer that question. Sorry, Chris. That's all right. We like it. That's all I can tell you. Our next question comes from Mark Ball. Hey, we just talked to that guy. Yeah. Well, Mark sent this in before he answered the landline of the damned, and I think this is a pretty serious question. The guy my fiancé and I are using to ordain our wedding next October is ordained in both the Unitarian and Satanist church. My fiancé has some vaguely religious folks on her side of the family. Should I play it safe and go with the Unitarian version, or let the future wife's side know what they are getting themselves into and go full-blown satanic ceremony? Oh, boy. That's so tempting. I know, right? So tempting, because you know the rebel inside me is just like, fuck yes, dude, go full-blown satanic, let them know what they're in for, blow the tops off of their fucking pea brains right off the bat, and then just deal with the aftermath later. But the reality is... Family's good to have, so maybe just keep it keep it a little vanilla. Is my advice. Keep it a little vanilla. Unitarian's fine. Nothing wrong with that. Sure. And then you know, if you want the full blown satanic ceremony later, give us a call. We'll hook you up. We can totally do it. Also, I think if you want to, you could combine the two at your actual wedding and just do the Unitarian service backwards. <laughs> that would be great. Oh, my God. Well, let's see. Next is from Matt Tangen, and I'm pretty sure this guy was listening to the show since before we started actually producing it. <laughs> Matt has this question. If Satan was to host a daytime talk show, much like Sally Jesse Raphael or Mari Povich, who would be the first guest and what would be the first topic? First of all, I think the show would just be called Satan with some big stylized S inside of a lavender square. Oh, yeah. You know, yeah, I think, yeah, I think of the graphic design, too. I think that his first guest would be Kenneth Copeland. I was going to say Pat Roberts, but Kenneth Copeland would be good, too. Okay. And the first topic would be, I made people pay for my jet plane, and I don't feel bad about it. Because there are other televangelists that have jet planes. I'm pretty sure Jesse Duplantis has a jet plane. Mm -hmm. Maybe Benny Hinn has a jet plane. I don't know. He can probably. He just takes off his fucking sports jacket, which is like the invisibility cloak of the televangelist world. He can just disapparate to wherever he needs to be. I think so. Anyway, that's 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 my thought. Ken Copeland, first guest. I like it. Or the topic could be people worse than me. <laughs> Then we could have Ken Copeland and, <laughs> and Benny Hinn. <laughs> we could just have the whole lineup. Just the whole TBN schedule. Just yeah. Right, Jim Baker. Just yeah. all right there. All of them. All right. Well, I'm going to read this last question. It's a bit of a long one. Oh, boy. Who's this one from? Yeah, no one, really. What? <laughs> Dear Ask the Goat, my dilemma involves a landlord-tenant dispute. I moved into my new place of residence via a legally binding Ouija contract. My landlord, R, was not expecting me to take up residence, but it's hardly my fault she's unaware of the nature of the contract. The piglet, er, lesser, is naturally unhappy with me as her tenant, but I like to think I haven't been completely unhelpful to her. I've helped her give voice to her sexual frustration, her feelings about her absentee father, and the irritating histrionics of her mother, who is a terrible, terrible Hollywood person starring in awful social justice movies. I can also neither confirm or deny that I protected her virtue with the con with, within connection to her mother's odious romantic interest, who had no place in her bedroom on a certain evening. Regardless, 
the lesser's mother is seeking to evict me, which suits me fine as I hope to use the upcoming legal battle to settle my differences with an old acquaintance. But first, I've been presented the opportunity to deal with a more inexperienced gentleman in a line of business similar to that of my acquaintance. Thus far, he's being only mildly annoying, trying to goad me into performing vulgar parlor tricks as though I was some kind of trained seal or something. And unfortunately for him, I have the inside knowledge to make his involvement very costly and, yes, painful for him. As an example, I may taunt him with updates about his deceased mother's current place of residence and her preferred activities there. It's not as if I care whether all these parties suffer. I look forward to it, but still, am I out of line here? Am I really the party in the wrong? Take care in how you respond, as I do not like to be disrespected. Signed, Enun Mai, which, of course, if you spell Enun Mai backwards, that's... I am no one. Exactly. Well, I mean, at least it's not from the mighty King Lucifuge Rofacal or whatever the <laughs> fuck that demon's name was. <laughs> All right, so this is this is a bit um, it's touchy. This is a bit touchy, and I got to tell you, I don't know. I, I mean, at least not here in Tennessee. I don't know that um, a five-minute conversation over a talking board is going to be a legally binding lease. So you might. Let me thus stand here. We are not attorneys. And yeah. We do not pretend to be one, and our advice is not meant to be taken into a court of law. There you go. That's our disclaimer. Um, so it might be a bit touchy for you there, bra. Um. I think the most, the best advice that I can give you as a former property manager is to just make sure that you are present in court and be respectful and say your piece and hope for the best. I honestly don't think it's going to be that difficult for you to find a new place to live. It may be an older residence, but probably a hardier residence than the one that you're in now. So think about that. Just think about moving. Got good bones. Right. Good bones, nice eyes. I mean, <laughs> good light f- fixtures is what I meant. So, yeah, cons- just just consider that. There may be an alternate living situation that you would be all right with if presented the opportunity or if an offer was made. That would be way easier than going through an eviction process. No kidding. <laughs> Well, kids, that's going to do it for this episode of Kiss the Goat. As always, we highly encourage you to join both the Legion Podcast Patreon and YouTube channel for neat, exclusive content from all the podcasts on the network. We also want to thank Bo, our fearless head honcho over at Legion, for continuing to allow us to spew our madness out upon the interwebs. That's what spew. 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 And, of course, thank you for listening as you do. I think we're supposed to ask you all to leave reviews on your preferred listening platform. So that's cool. Give us as many stars as you think we deserve, like five, maybe eight. Can we do eight? Yeah, let's – eight stars. I see it. I see the snake. Will you come get it, please? <laughs> Where is it? It's in front of the refrigerator. Well, maybe it wants another beer. Oh, it's cute. Is it poisonous? Oh, hell no. It's just a garden snake. I mean, it's big, but that doesn't mean it's poisonous. Oh, honey, can we keep it? You are not serious. Well, why not? We don't have any mice to feed it. We don't have a tank to keep it in. Well, so what? Let's put it in the cellar. Where Stephanie lives? Ah, that bitch ain't here. Besides, how funny will it be when she does come back and there's a snake in her bed? (laughs) Oh, that's wicked. That's just plain mean. I like that idea. (laughs) Oh, we should name it. What do you want to name it? No idea. I don't, what the fuck do you name a I don't know what you name a snake. Let's ask, <laughs> let's ask our listeners. Oh, that's a great idea. Hey, if you guys have a good suggestion for a snake name, hit us up on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or at our unconsecrated email address and let us know. You just might be the lucky acolyte who gets to name our snake. Not a euphemism. <laughs> Until next time, I'm Cootie. My name is X. Hail, Hail Satan. Satan. Send the snake names. All the snake names. Hello, welcome to Skype call testing service. After the beep, please record a message. Afterwards, your message will be played back to you. <laughs>
Justified. I mean, pff, fuck. Three, two. <sighs> Sheridan lets Mark borrow her car. Paul. Paul. I, God Paul damn it. Mark. I know I did. God damn it. I forgot to fix it in the fucking script. <laughs> Shit. Hold on. Three, two. Pharaoh takes it upon. Pharaoh takes. Three, two. Movie fun. They should have at least sent her to the same crematorium they sent the first date by to. We, I know, right? We burned the witch, yay! Yeah. <laughs> there was much rejoicing. <laughs> so, and he says the book is the Pharaoh... Fa- fa- Pharaoh? Pharaoh. Right? Three, two. The mayor tells... Like, what did the film make? What do you figure the pitch for this movie was? Makers say to talk investors into... In, God damn it. Three, two. So, Mark, we we have to know your middle initial is C, and yep. that happens to be my middle initial also. <laughs> my, mine is Christian, is what the C is short for. I almost got named Christian, but they didn't like the idea of me being called Chris, so they went with, "Well, let's go. Let's name him after our friend that's a postman that played bass in my mom's first husband's band. So I'm named after Mark the Postman, the bass player. <laughs> that's great. <laughs> We've got. Banana peppers that and you jalapenos know, and dude, they're fucking huge. I mean, they're like butt plug size. <laughs> <laughs> they I don't wouldn't have... recommend using that for that purpose. Uh, maybe not. There's no flared base, so no, of course don't do that. <laughs> but... Lose them up there, right? <laughs> That's the last thing you want to do. Just go to it's the like fucking Taco Bell <laughs> <laughs> in reverse. <laughs> you don't want to end up at the fucking Walgreens little clinic being like, dude, um, I've got some jalapeno shoved up my ass. Can you help me? <laughs> How are your ding-dongs? They're momentarily quiet and sequestered behind a fence. So if you can peer, can peer I don't. I just invented an accent. <laughs> I love it. If you can peer. <laughs> no more Julia Child Let's for play. you. <laughs> Let's play what country of origin Al comes from that's not on planet Earth. Uh, I'm piecing it all together in my head right now. Just, I hate to bother you. <laughs> are you using the regular loops on those shoes, or are you just shaking your foot until everything just comes together? It's time for Casper, Wyoming Casper. Tell you what, that's fine. Let's just take this from the top because I think I fucked up mine too. Three, two.